Welcome to Petability. I'm your host, Kathy Simon, Certified Veterinary Technician and Certified Canine Rehabilitation Practitioner. And I'm your host, Chris Cranston, Licensed Physical Therapist and Small Animal Physical Rehabilitationist. Our podcast provides interviews and information to help your pets live their best lives. Good afternoon, Chris. How are you on this fine day? I'm well because we just received our year-end review, if you will, from our podcasting uh, host, Buzzsprout, and it made me feel really good about all of our hard work this year, 2023. Buzzsprout says our top five episodes in 2023, Lori McCauley, she's the mother of veterinary rehabilitation. That's what they call her. So that was a big get. It was really exciting. Number two, owner's perspective of a dog living with degenerative myelopathy, Phoebe Hart, helped a lot of people get through their journey with degenerative myelopathy and their dog. And um, our fan friend, Bethany Brown, wildlife rehabilitator, Bethany Brown from Saco River. And then one of my all-time favorites, just because we love her so much, the, the compliment of Western and Eastern veterinary medicine with Dr. Bethany Smyers Innes, one of our favorite people. And then one that we did together, the vet, vet prep and pointers for taking your pet to the vet. So uh, those are the top five this year of 2023. Just some statistics, because you know I'm a statistic geek. Yes. So we publish every two weeks. So this episode that you're listening to at the end of 2023 is our 26th episode of the year. So putting out a show, uh, an episode every two weeks does take a fair amount of, of work. If you've never done a podcast, you may not have any idea what goes in behind the, the scenes, but uh, we are happy to do it. I always love learning from our guests and we have maintained putting out a new episode since our inception way back in 2020, March of 2020. So very proud of that. And uh, we are in the top 50% of all podcasts that are produced by Buzzsprout, through Buzzsprout. So that's a big feather in our cap. Isn't that crazy? Oh. We're just two canine rehabilitation practitioners who are now in the top 50% of Buzzsprout podcasts. Exactly. Yeah, who would have thunk? Yeah. And then geographically, I always find this fascinating. So our our top number of downloads came from the city of San Jose, California. So Kathy, let's give a sh shout out to our fans Whoop. in San, San Jose. Jose. Thank you, San Jose. Yeah, Thank you. clear <laughs> across the country because Kathy and I are on the East Coast. So I think that's pretty cool. And then, of course, downloads in terms of countries, U.S. is by far number one. But we also have a number of listeners in Canada, Germany, the U.K., and Australia. So, again, welcome glo global friends, one and all. Thank you. Thank you for your support. <laughs> you know, when we started this way back when, what was it? What did we say? 2020. You know, we, we started it with the goal of, of trying to educate owners, talk to other pet rehabbers and uh, get the perspective of uh, maybe owners that have animals with disabilities and trying to normalize that. And I think we're really on track with that. And, uh, you know, we, we really truly, as our tagline says, we want your dog, we want your pet to live their best life. And that's our motivation. Yes. And, you know, you, you made a, a, just a little faux pas there saying dog and, you know, by and far, that's the vast majority of our uh, episodes are, are covering our canine friends, but we purposely made the title of this show Petability because we did want to speak to all species of pets. You know, one isn't more or less important than another. They're all loved and we're trying our best to, you know, touch on a number of those uh, different kinds of pets in our world. You know, also, I we've talked about this before, Kathy, that as far as getting the message out, we wanted to reach a broader audience and, you know, versus what you and I could do on an individual basis, you know, one-on-one -on -one with a pet owner in a clinic. You know, many of, of the things that we've learned in terms of good products and best practices and so forth over the years, we thought could perhaps benefit many, many more and just wanted to get that message out to to the masses. And by the number of downloads that we're getting, I think that we have achieved that goal too, but there's always so, so many more people to reach. So please tell your family, friends, neighbors, 
to download, listen, follow Petability Podcast and, and follow us on all of our social media. Kathy does a bang up job of, of doing all the socials. So appreciate that, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Chris, what do you think uh, we're going to talk about today? Well, I this is my gift to you. So again, we're recording this on December 21st, 2023. It will publish in just a, a few days. And Kathy, because you love feet so much, <laughs> uh, this is my present for the holidays, Christmas, year end. We are going to talk about everything feet today. <laughs> I love feet and there's a reason for it. I, I'm just, you know, when I'm talking, and I'm going to say right now specifically dog feet, but I do love all feet. Uh, maybe not human feet, but but animal feet. So I'm just in awe of its structure and function. The dog foot is made so durable, Chris, that it can traverse rock, sand, snow, cement, and yet so sensitive with those recep receptors in their feet that if you just touch it lightly, that dog will re retract their foot. And I think if the human foot possess this durability, we probably wouldn't become instantly incapacitated by stepping barefoot like on a pebble, right? right. <laughs> There's just so much to talk about, about the feet and why they're important. I'll, let me tell you a little story. I had a patient many years ago who called me up and said my dog broke their uh, middle toe, front leg, weight-bearing toe, and the dog was in a cast. And their veterinarian said, you don't need rehab. It's just a toe. I went Blasphemy! I went insane. And this is a working dog. This is a dog that actually is a working dog. And I was like, that is the most absurd, ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Yes, you should be in, in therapy to rehab that toe. So maybe it seems silly to, you know, people who aren't in rehab or people that don't have working dogs, but your toes are important. <laughs> You're so important. <laughs> right. You know, you mentioned that we're going to be just sticking to canine feet, our dog's feet today, just because there is so much to cover. And, you know, but I started thinking about this and, you know, the, the function of the foot is important across all species, you know, reptiles and birds. You know, you've talked in the past about the ability to, to perch um, is, you know, just critical for our bird friends. And because I don't work with them, I, I don't think about it, you know, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. But I did think about when I was cons consulting at the New England Aquarium years ago, and it was that I was called in, there was a fur seal. And these can get up to four to 500 pounds. And his name was Baranov, and he was having some mobility issues. And it was mainly with his feet, which I'm like, What's the foot on a fur seal, right? I had to, you know, <laughs> look up the anatomy, but it's their flipper. And lo and behold, when I got there, his, you can see his toenails. I mean, I never thought about it before, but the nails are right there at the end of the flipper. And, you know, he being land and water creatures, you know, he needed to be able to negotiate on land and um, he was having some problems with his feet. And so you know, again, just can't be more important. And I think that as rehabbers, Kathy, physical rehabilitationists, we believe, and I don't want to speak for you, so correct me if I'm wrong, but <laughs> that so much of a being's quality of life has to do with their ability to move and move pain-free. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'd say for our dog friends that, you know, the top three things in life are to eat, sleep, and move. So I do believe firmly that the dog's feet play a vital role in their overall health and well-being, allowing them to participate in enrichment activities and to, to be mobile and independent. And that's just so, so important. And as we wrapped up the year, I was thinking about other episodes that we've done that have touched on feet or a ancillary topic very close to feet and that would be our episodes on traction we did that way back in 2020 because it was so important to us to get that information out there and then following that we interviewed dr julie busby which i'm also very proud to call our friend who developed the toe grip so dr busby's toe grips is actually one of our affiliates and if you use our code you can get a discount and support our show 
as well. And then we recently, fairly recently, did an episode about toe-up devices for those uh, pets, again, namely dogs that are dragging their feet or knuckling where they stand on the tops of their feet uh, due to maybe a neurological insult or weakness. So, you know, those are, are other episodes that you may want to tune into. And then on our YouTube, you recently told me, Kathy, that we have 29,000 views discussing anatomy and palpation of a dog, our friend Libby, the golden retriever. But along with that, there is a special foot episode. Um, so if you want to look into that and have a visual about some of the things that, that we're going to be talking about today, please check out the YouTube channel. Why don't we go right into sort of maybe talking about the anatomy of the dog foot? Uh, because the anatomy can be a bit complex. There are many bones and ligaments and tendons, and any of those <laughs> can be injured at any time. And then talk a little bit about like uh, the foot itself, like the toenails, the digital pads, the metacarpal pad, the dew claw, and the carpal pad. Where are they and what are their function? So as you mentioned, uh, many bones, ligaments, and tendons, but we're going to just talk about the basic structure of a dog's paw or foot. You know, I guess one of the things that, that we may not always recognize is, and it's pretty easy if you look there, I've had people come into the clinic and, you know, maybe about a hip issue or something. And I'm like, oh, your dog's, you know, toe is sticking up. And they're like, what? I've never noticed that. And, you know, it's kind of like giving the finger, you know, it's just like <laughs> yeah. sticking up in space. And, and then they'll relate something like, you know, five years ago, you know, our dog was limping really badly, but we took her to the vet and they couldn't find anything, but that can be indicative of an injury to a tendon or ligament. I think oftentimes we think of maybe a fracture or dislocation, which can also be that, but if the, the feet are really flat or really clawed in general, there could be an issue that's different on one foot versus the others, or maybe front feet versus back feet. But um, also, if you notice that a particular toe or digit is malaligned, that's something to certainly look into. You know, you mentioned kind of the various parts. Uh, dogs have four toes or digits, but there's that tricky one called the dew claw. The dew claw is that fifth digit that actually kind of disappeared when dogs were domesticated thousands of years ago, especially in the back foot. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the dew claw going forward, but generally they start, they, they're missing their thumb, if you will, or the thumb isn't that functional. You will see that on the side of the paw in the front a lot of times, but not on the rear foot. And then you start on the inside with number two, then three, then four, then five. So their fifth toe is like our pinky and our pinky toe or our pinky finger. And there are, like I said before, many, many different joints and things just in the toes themselves. And then as you work up the foot and it articulates with the ankle or tarsus, when you're talking about the pads on the bottom of the foot, each one of those toes has a digital pad. So they are bearing some weight on, on those pads in the front. And then behind those digit pads is a heart-shaped pad that should be, you know, fairly sizable and squishy. And that's called the metacarpal pad on the front or the metatarsal pad on the rear. Very important for weight bearing. And then as you continue going up the leg, there is a gumdrop shaped pad called the carpal pad that's a little bit higher up and usually isn't uh, bearing weight when the dog is simply standing, but it can act as, as a stopper going steep downhill and helping with turns and things like that with doing more athletic. And depth. I think it's important here, Chris, to mention too that, you know, we, we've talked about this on other shows that you know, unlike people who are plantar grade, dogs are digigrade. So the importance of your dog's toe, those middle toes is weight bearing. I think that just plays into what you're talking about. You know, they're made, all these toes are made of keratin, collagen, and adipose tissue, and they're all designed to provide traction, increase endurance, uh, and make activities such as running and coming to a stop possible, but also, you know, importantly, those two toes for, for weight bearing. And we'll get a little deeper into, you know, the biomechanics and the purpose of these things um, as we get further into the show. But, you know, we've also probably, Kathy, don't think about all the potential problems. So even when I was researching, you know, I had one idea in my mind, like we we're going to talk about dog feet. And because I'm a physical therapist, I'm thinking about 
anatomy and orthopedic problems such as arthritis. But the one of the number one issues with feet is allergies. And when your dog is yes. chewing on their feet, oftentimes it's due to allergies. It could be a food allergy. It could be a, an environmental allergy. So that is certainly something to, to keep in mind. And then there are other issues such as infections, cuts and abrasions, nail issues, cysts. Cysts are very, very common, more than I ever realized in dog feet and cancer is common in dog feet. So like our friend Patty Ramirez said, check your dogs, your pups for lumps and bumps because and include those feet because it can be a painful cyst or potentially a cancerous tumor. You know, anything like a, a cracked uh, pad um, can be just so, so painful. If there's dryness or the pads are extra thick, it's called hyperkeratosis the body makes too much keratin and in the, the outer layers. And this results in coarse hair, like paw pads. And the first time I saw this, I was like, what is that? Because it's like these, these filaments. feathers, it's like feathers. It's, it is wild. And you can, you know, you can move them. It, it is, it's like thick, coarse hairs coming out of their, their paw pad. And I actually have a, a dog right now that I return to his house simply to do nail trims and trim back that keratin uh, causing those, those pad issues and, and keep him comfortable. He's finished with his rehab, but they uh, recognize the importance of keeping his feet healthy. So the other thing that I think is really cool about dog feet is there's, there's different types of dog feet, right? This, they're not all the same, you know, dog feet come in different sizes and different shapes. And for dogs, so for some dogs, their foot is round and for sight hounds, their dogs are what you would call a hare foot because it's similar to a, a rabbit's foot. And they're just, they're all different shape, but they all have the same function. And some of them are really great for things like your labs. They're, they're rounded shape and they have webs in between their toes and it's great for swimming. And your hare foot dogs are ready to go. They're ready to take off because of the position of their toes. So it's really uh, by design a very exciting anatomy. <laughs> yes. And, and you said they're all the same function and in some ways, yes, but then you just describe different func functions. So, well, they're, yeah, they're all function in as far as like weight bearing and oh, stopping. No, and, I agree and, with you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. You know, basic function is the same, but then you have these nuances and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's like this form follow function or function follow form. You know, you think about evolution and what the various dog breeds were created to do you know one example i i thought of was you know like the dogs that are in the snow like a saint bernard for example their foot is really broad and very floofy because it basically acts like a snowshoe right they don't want to post hole down through the snow that would be very hard to negotiate they want to stay on top of the snow as much as they can so they don't have a little skinny you know stick like foot that is just jab right down in they have a wide snowshoe type of foot then you already mentioned like some of the racing breeds like greyhound their foot is very narrow they don't have excess fur and and it's actually very arched if you will and kind of stiff so when they come down on that foot the ligaments and tendons act almost like a trampoline where you get this rebound effect which springs them and propels them forward and makes their their gait very efficient for running fast so that it's not a lot of shock absorption. It hits and boom, springs right off the surface. So mm -hmm. I think that's just really cool as well. And I think regardless of what type of foot your dog has, the importance of good foot care for all dogs, as you said earlier, contributes to their overall well-being. And so some of these things are going to include you know, keeping your dog's foot hair trimmed so that they, that will aid them in their traction. So they don't have feet that are like slippers, you know, slipping on the floor, checking their foot for like burrs that could get stuck in there, ice, snow, those can make snowballs, you know, they get stuck in the hair and they're really painful to remove. So I think, you know, inspecting your dog's feet on a regular basis is really important. You know, checking for cuts, cracks, pebbles, lumps, bumps, uh, checking in between the toes for those cysts, redness, swelling, bad odor 
anything. I mean, her feet, mm. dogs' feet smell like popcorn or or uh, corn chips. They shouldn't smell like infection. Yeah, that's a sign of yeast, right, Kathy? I think that it's a certain bacteria that makes the foot smell like that, and it's not mm. unusual. But you don't want to have an overly yeasty smell to the foot, and and certainly you don't want it to be like red, oozy, you know, uh, pussy, things like that. So these are all things you need to report to your veterinarian. But also, you know, as durable as the foot is, it's also very susceptible to things like burning or blistering or, you know, cracking in the, you know, really harsh cold weather. So, you know, as these dogs, you know, in the summertime months or where, depending on where you live, because it might be warm wherever you live all the time, but here, you know, in the summer months, it's important to use caution when you're walking your dog on hot pavement because it can burn their feet and it can burn and blister. Um, and that's painful and it causes mobility impairments. So you really need to check that pavement, you know, check it with your hand for like 10 seconds. Or if you can put your hand there from like 10 to 20 seconds and leave it there, then your dog is is, is probably going to be okay with walking on that. Um, and same thing with the cold weather, like check for ice and salt. It checked for painful cracks. I mean, salt in a a painful in a crack on your dog's foot that will render them immobilized they will pick that foot up it is so painful so i think you know regular inspection of the feet are are important for your dog's care absolutely and you know talking about the pads you you mentioned before that they have fat in their their paw pads and that does help to protect them from some of those extreme temperatures and things like that but as dogs age the fat in their feet actually diminishes. I know even for myself, as I'm getting older, I need to wear shoes in the house on hardwood floors now. Used to be able to go barefooted all the time. And that's because I need that padding of the shoe because I'm losing it in my feet. You know, that's something to to certainly consider. And the not only do those those pads protect from temperature, they also help with shock absorption as you know, I alluded to, and locomotion, the traction and gripping on the ground. So a dog's pad should be like an athletic shoe, a sneaker. They should have some traction, some uh, suppleness, and, and so forth. They shouldn't be like a dried out, smooth, I always say penny loafer, because you can kind of relate to that, right? Those leather soles that just get so smooth with wear over time. And again, that's something that happens with aging. So it pays to to not only inspect, but then what do you do about it? How do you care for it? So maybe using something like Musher Secret to help with the ice and snow and salt. It can, if you don't put it on too frequently, it can also add some moisture to the pads and keep them a little more supple. You don't want to do it too frequently because you don't want it to become too soft as their foot pads are their shoes. So it needs to have a toughness, but yet a suppleness. Does that make any sense? It's kind of like, yeah. yeah. One of the things that, you know, it makes me think of, because that foot will get so smooth. um, You can actually rough it up just a little bit with a, with a, um, yeah, with a with a gentle nail file, just sort of rough the surface of it. You don't need to go full hard on it, just a little bit to roughen up the surface, just to get a little bit there so that we can get some better traction. Because now otherwise you're walking around, like you said, in like a in like your socks on hardwood floors. You're just sliding and it's yeah. too smooth. It's worn Especially down. Especially if you don't trim that foot fur. That's where I use right. the sock analogy. Because if you're ever if you ever worn wool socks on a hardwood floor or tile floor, whoop gone. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, It's really slippery. I remember he was a friend of ours. You and I both had the pleasure of treating an elder statesman um, who was a labradoodle. And I checked his, his paws. We were doing nail trims and I'm like, what is it? And as I started exploring the mats in his feet were so hard and so embedded, it must've felt like he was walking with a rock in his shoe. And, you know, you think about all that intricate anatomy, too. And if you have a, a mat, a knot, um, you know, between the toes, it can cause them to spread. It can, you know, be just poking up inside there. And I did. I found all this debris that was hidden in there. I mean, we took out so much and the owner was flabbergasted. From that point on, we checked them very regularly. But, you know, the, the both the 
nail trims and the fur, fur trims, as you alluded to, right. are very important. We'll go a little bit more into nail trims a, a bit yeah. later. Well, but, remember when we talked to our friend, um, Megan Terwilliger, about grooming and its role and function and how these mats are painful because they pull. So you're right. They're, they're not only going to be, uh, you know, painful, like you're stepping on a rock, but they're also going to be pulling at the myofascia and it, it's painful. It's just like somebody pulling your hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was talking about the pads when I was saying, you know, they need to, to be, you know, kind of tough on the, the exterior, but yet squishy, you know, for shock absorption and things. But in terms of the, the overall foot, you know, it needs to be strong for weight bearing, but yet flexible enough to adapt to the various terrain. So imagine, you know, when your dog is walking on rocks, grass, things like that, and how the foot has to conform to those various surfaces. And if they have a condition like degenerative joint disease or arthritis in their feet, makes those digits very stiff. And, and you know, if you ever had arthritis in your hands, think about if you had to walk on those painful hands, you know, that's, <laughs> that's yeah. really uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really uh, a balance, I would say, with a lot of things related to the feet. They really are remarkable. Yeah, they really are. And we should treat feet like they are our dog's greatest asset. It made me think when you were talking about the dog going over different terrain, about all the receptors in the feet and the messages that the brain is getting from the feet receptors on how to respond to their environment. And it's all happening seamlessly in the brain, just getting this message and feedback from the feet. So I, 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 on one hand, I think it's great if you have, you know, something like pause booties to cover their feet when they go out in the snow, but the importance of getting information from the ground is really important for navigating your environment. And that's actually why I like pause as opposed to uh, a stiffer boot. I mean, if they need it, they need it, you know, if there's an, an injury or something like that, but the pause is like a balloon that goes on their foot. And so they can feel their the environment more than with a lot of other footwear and adapt and get that feedback and so forth and mean because they get so much information from the ground too like even balance is is affected if you you know put something that constricts their toes or um that they can't get you know all the nuances uh from from the surface that they're walking on that helps them to be very agile the one other thing i wanted to mention is examining your dog's feet for calluses. They really shouldn't have calluses. If they do, that can be a sign of abnormal friction or weight bearing in an area that isn't necessarily designed for weight bearing. So I've often noticed that when I am, you know, trimming a dog's nails, I might see that there are calluses on maybe one digit or on the outside of the foot um, on one leg, but not on the opposite leg. And so again, that can tell us information, give us information about what else may be going on. There may be something higher up in terms of the body. We call that the kinetic chain. So it goes up the chain from the foot to the ankle, to the knee, to the hip, to the spine, in the back. And in the front, it would be foot to wrist to elbow, to shoulder, to neck and spine. And uh, so, you know, even if a dog lifts its head to one side more than the other, it can cause asymmetrical weight bearing and thus result in maybe a callus formation on a digit or part of the foot. So we may want to adjust how we're walking the dog or have their neck checked out or something like that. So if you notice anything that's abnormal, asymmetrical, you know, definitely mention it to your vet. Oh. I think that even looking for how wide, for example, your dog's paw print is from side to side can be indicative of weight bearing status. Right. So when your dog is putting in a lot of weight through a limb, their foot will splay. And for example, if they're out in the, you know, rain and then, you know, you walk them onto dry pavement and you see, wow, that right front foot pad or footprint is very wide and the left front right. one isn't as wide or same like in the snow. Oh, yeah. You can sometimes see it in the snow. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, all of those things are worth noting and perhaps mentioning to your vet for further follow-up. And one other thing that I think is interesting about dog's feet is that they're similar front to back. 
right? Unlike ours, like our hands are analogous to their front feet and our feet are analogous to their back feet, the rear feet. And think about how different our hands and feet operate. You know, one is for weight bearing, one is for manipulating, whereas all four of the dog's feet are for weight bearing. But there might be a subtle difference in that, you know, the the fronts are typically larger, um, including their nails. Um, They may be a little bit larger. And they're used for for stopping and digging and that sort of thing, whereas the hind feet are used more for propulsion, acceleration, you know, again, contrasting with the front that would be for stopping and deceleration. But, you know, other than that, they're very, very similar in their structure. And and another difference for these dogs is, is their dew claws. So in the front feet, your dog is born with a dew claw. And, you know, there, there used to be an old school thought that the, that front dew claw didn't really have a purpose, but I, I believe it does. And if you listen to, uh, if you've ever listened to Christine Zink talk or lecture, she'll tell you that that dew claw has a purpose and it's for preventing torquing or sometimes grabbing. Um, and it does have a ligament attachment there. So, you know, every dog is, you're going to see born with them. Now, I know that some breeders take them off. I don't know what the purpose of that is, uh, but you should have a dew claw when your dog is born. You should have a dew claw on the front. Now, Dew claws in the back, although you rarely see them, are just pendulous. I'm not sure that there's any real function to them, but you will see double dew claws in the back in in um, breeds like the Briard. You'll you'll see them born with them. Pyrenees, Great Pyrenees will have them as well. So if you have one of those breeds or a mix, don't be alarmed. That's not a that's not a pendulous tumor. That is actually yeah, it's a genetic <laughs> actually, trait. So yeah. again, when it comes to the rear, some dogs are born with them, some dogs aren't. If they are born with them, sometimes they're more firmly attached and other times they're pendulous. And I think when they are not attached, you know, you referred to the ligament in the front, but if they don't have, if it's just basically skin that's holding this nail on, they're very susceptible to injury. And my cavaliers actually were born with dew claws in the rear. Really? So when they went in for their spays and neuters, they remove those rear dew claws at the same time because they were for the most part pendulous but I remember you know so two dogs four dew claws I remember one of them being closer and more firmly attached and that one took a little bit longer to heal and so forth but why did I want them removed and in con- consultation with the veterinarian because I didn't want to risk injury down the road you know if they yeah. were to catch them on something you know, it can rip off that nail, can rip off the whole digit and that's terrible. Yeah. I've seen it and it, and it's, it's a, it's a painful thing and it bleeds and bleeds and bleeds. And this is the kind of thing that would probably end you in the, in the ER to get that taken care of. You know, and you mentioned bleeding too, Kathy. And I think that another thing that bleeds like you wouldn't believe is, is a nail issue. Um, You know, so we talked about the dew claw, but, but any nail, it can be susceptible to splitting, um, getting caught tearing and, you know, so, so painful. Mm. And, you know, that kind of leads me into, you know, many dogs don't like, like their paws being touched. You know, why is that? I, you know, my feeling is it's always been because of, they have so many nerve endings in their feet. Can you, you know, just, just think about somebody like tickling your foot and, and what that sensation is like. I think those nerve endings are very, very responsive to touch. Yeah. Well, and then conversely, how much information they are being deprived of if they have a neurological issue and start to lose sensation in their feet, you know, it really makes negotiating their environment difficult because they're not getting that feedback from the ground. So, you know, when going back to traction and things, I love to put something on, on the ground as opposed to the dog to enhance, you know, every feeling and sensory information that that they can possibly get. And, you know, I also was reading that there's a thought that maybe the hind feet are a bit more sensitive than the front feet because when dogs are puppies, it's much more common to touch the front feet, play with the front feet because they're, they're there, you know, they're, they're in the front and you're, you're interacting with your puppy. And so even if you aren't mindful of it, it's just happening. But for that reason, I think it's really important to desensitize to touching the feet when these 
puppies are very young, right? Along with their mouths and their ears and, and all of that, because we want them to be comfortable with handling their feet. However, Kathy, in practice, I've actually found that the hind feet tend to be less, less sensitive, you know, not more sensitive. So I think maybe it's because the hind feet are farther from the brain. And when we do start to lose some neural acuity, that tends to happen farthest from the brain. And so when I do a nail trim, for example, I'll often start with with the hind feet it could also be that it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for the dog, right? So if the dog's distracted in the front with a toy or whatever, then I can handle their, their hind feet rather easily. But if I'm handling their front feet, their face is right there. So they know what I'm doing. They can't be distracted right. from it, you know, enough. So I don't know, a couple of theories uh, to think about with your own dogs. Or maybe they feel like, you know, uh, like Bobby Lyons said when we talked to her, so many dogs don't know where their rear end is. And so maybe mm -hmm. they're not even making the connection when exactly. you're you're cutting, you know, your their nails and so forth. But yeah, a lot of good interesting theories there about the foot and why it doesn't why they don't like you to touch the, the foot. My dog is very foot sensitive. Thankfully, we see a fear free groomer and she has, you know, worked with him uh, extensively to get him to a point where she can you know, cut his toenails and, and take care of his feet. And he has a grass allergy. So he needs to have his feet, you know, checked and his toes check and stuff. So it can be done, right? It can be done to teach your dog to accept the touch of their feet, but again, in a fear-free manner and with the consent of the dog. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you are familiar. I certainly wasn't when I, before I started working with with dogs and, and small animals, but there's actually a genetic or breed disposition to certain conditions related to canine feet. For example, uh, I learned that pugs and bulldogs tend to have more infections. Um, I don't know if, if Mac has had that. I hope yeah. not. You know, Chris, Mac has a grass allergy. And so we are constantly checking and wiping his feet from when he comes, you know, when he comes inside from outside because of the irritation that that causes for him and the inflammation that occurs as a response to the allergy. And um, one of the things I use when that when that happens for him is um, the Medco Vet Luma. I, it really is really helpful for, um, you know, controlling that inflammation as well as giving him some relief. I had a really tough case, and so I learned very quickly about corns or plantar warts in greyhounds. So basically, it's a wart that grows inward, and I've had them myself. I know it sounds gross, but as opposed to outward, and so this hard, callous lump is growing toward those very nerve endings and blood vessels and things. And when the greyhound in particular, any dog I think can get them, but greyhounds in particular are prone to them. Um, you know, it's very, very painful. So providing them with a well-padded shoe and various things is, is required for them to be more comfortable. So if, if your pet is limping, the first thing you should check is their, their foot you know, and go between those toes and between all those pads and bend and straighten them and, you know, splay the digits and, and squeeze and touch and just, you know, starting gently, but explore that foot and just make sure it's not something very simple that can be uh, rectified because again, it can be so, so painful. Yeah. And those, those plantar warts and greyhounds are extremely pain painful for those dogs and it's very limiting for them as far as their mobility goes. So Kathy, how, you know, we're talking about how sensitive it is and how painful, what are some of the common behavioral signs that we might see in dogs? You know, besides the obvious, you know, they're holding their paw up or, or limping, you know, as we've mentioned, what are some other things that might be indicative of discomfort, sensitivity, or potentially an injury in, a, in the foot? I would say licking, licking is probably the first thing I would, do, I would think of as far as is there pain in the foot or is there something going on with the foot? So let's say you got, like you said, a sliver in the foot. We're going to lick that foot. We've got a cut on the foot. We're going to lick that foot. You have osteoarthritis. You want it to make it feel better. You're going to lick that foot. Right. Something happens. You have a nerve injury to your foot. You're going to lick yep. and chew that foot. Feels abnormal. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess that goes back to dogs not having all that many things at their disposal. So their go-to is to lick to soothe. So no matter what the cause is, their answer is to lick. So if your dog is licking something, again, allergies, um, pay attention, listen yeah. to your pet. We always talk about that. Listen to your pet. This is how they're talking to you. 
And then, of course, there are other things, pain, um, pain when you touch the foot, withdrawing the foot, decrease in range of motion. You know, we talked on another show about your, uh, your, you know, injury to the foot and how those toe flexors sort of pull the foot into that flex position. It looks like a claw. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Conversely, if it's really flat and pancaked. Right, right. Either. It, it should be, it, it shouldn't be either or. Um, and the other thing is, you know, like you, that leads me to think into posture. If your dog's posture is off, are they rocking back on the back of their feet when they should be on their toes? Um, if they should be on their, they should be on their toes. And if they're rocking back, that could be a, an indication of a problem. It can also be an indication that your toenails are too long. And I think a lot of times, especially with those little dogs, when they have arthritic feet or other joints, mm-hmm. they tend to have that real prancy gait. Yeah. Where they don't want to spend much time. It's almost like they're, you know, they're walking on something sharp or hot or whatever. And they're and it's kind of a quick high step. I think sometimes that can be a change that is indicative of something going on, mm-hmm. you know, in the in the feet. Yeah. Good advice. Chris. They just walk walk that way naturally. <laughs> and then we mentioned, you know, toenail trims. And I would say uh, there are so many of animals out there with toenails that are too long. And I think that people are often shocked when I tell them that their dog's toenails are too long. And this can be problematic for so many reasons. And it makes me think, you know, of those little tiny bones that we talked about in the dog's foot and how those nails push up into that nail bed. And the wear and the tear on those small joints is a contributing factor to osteoarthritis in the foot. Uh, so it's so important to keep those nails trim. And again, we talked about rocking back or making room for those nails. So taking your weight off of the front of the, the weight-bearing toes and rocking back on your feet. So let's say, think about this. You walk on the bottom of your your foot, right? We walk flat-footed. But what if you walked on the ball of your foot all day? How would that feel? How would your calves feel? How would your legs feel? How painful would you be at the end of the day? And so you're saying like when the dog has to rock back oppositely, yeah. like yeah. going more toward their heel, that's analogous to us having to walk up on the, the ball of our foot. That's yeah. what I'm thinking, you know, and just think about how that, how your calves would feel if you walked on the ball of your foot all day. It <laughs> affects all the, the biomechanics all the way up that kinetic chain again, you know, right, all the way up right. to their, their spine and, you know, causing improper weight distribution and weight mm-hmm. bearing. And, you know, earlier I mentioned calluses, but also looking at different wear of the different toenails. So you've mentioned a couple times, Kathy, that the the middle two digits, which are actually numbers three and four, because remember that thumb doesn't really exist for at all or for weight bearing purposes on the front. So those middle digits are often maybe a little bit shorter because they're the primary weight bearing digits and thus their nails are going to be more susceptible to wearing on surfaces such as pavement. But you know, how many times have we seen where maybe the fifth digit, their pinky, is like super long and almost curled under, and and then that inside digit is almost worn down to a nub. You know, so that means that they're they're really distributing their weight on the inside of that foot, and that's not normal. So right. check it out. What's happening? Can it be changed? Can we affect it in a positive way? But certainly trimming those nails to make them even and not further contributing to that uneven distribution is imperative. Right. And how much information do you and I get from looking at toenails? Like I get so much information. I'm like, huh, this toenail is scuffed. Hmm, This toenail is long, Mm -hmm. but this one is short, just like you discussed. Mm -hmm. I can get a lot of information from looking at your dog's toenail wear. Uh, So as a rehabber, it's kind of like it gives me a little bit more feedback. But, you know, again, we got to keep these dogs' toenails to an appropriate length. And, you know, when we talked to our friend Megan about this, she was saying that, you know, you should not hear your dog's toenails on the floor. And if you hear your dog's toenails on the floor, they're too long. Yeah, they should never touch the floor in stance. So if you get down low and they're just in a relaxed standing posture, the nails should be up off the floor. If they're if they need to dig in, you know, to the point of Dr. Busby's toe, toe grips, right? They're yeah. trying to get traction. They're going to use those toe flexors and the, and the nails are going to touch the floor. But if they're just la 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 across mm-hmm. the floor, it shouldn't be like tap, 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 tap. It yeah. should be a much more quiet gait. And so we should get our dog's toenails trimmed. I do every four to eight weeks. Some people do every two to six weeks. I think it depends on your dog, how much wear they're getting, because like if I'm not walking my dog, on concrete, they may not wear as much as they do, you know, walking in the grass, or maybe he's not as active and they're not wearing down naturally. So 
uh, Megan, because Megan's my groomer, she suggests for Mac that I cut them every four weeks. Yeah. And I, and I think you're, you're right, Kathy. I, I was thinking two weeks only in that if they are too long, you need to do it more frequently, taking just a little bit off at a time because they have that blood vessel and nerve growing down into the nail, which is referred mm. to as the quick. Right. So you can't cut them back to what would be the ideal length all at once. You have to take a little bit off at a time every two weeks or so until you get them back to that ideal length because the quick will recede with the nail trims. And then as a maintenance, to your point, it can be every four to eight weeks. You know, I think just like people, you know, certain people's fingernails, hair, it's all keratin, grow quickly and others grow grows more slowly. So I think dogs are different as well. And in terms of, of the amount of growth and the frequency, right. they need their nails trimmed. But Kathy, other species need their nails trimmed too, right? Well, goodness, they sure do. You know, we, we did a whole show where you talked to me about rehabilitation for pet birds. And one of the things I touched on that was really important was the length of their toenails. If their toenails are too long, they can get them caught on things like a rope perch. They can get them caught on toys that are chain linked. They're very sharp. If you hold your bird, it's very painful. They'll cut into you. It disrupts their balance on thing on grabbing perches because their toenails are too long. And then again, I talked about, you know, getting caught on a rope perch. And I, I can't tell you how many birds I've seen that have strangulated their toe. Uh, because it got wrapped around the nail and then then up oh, the foot to the toe no. and had to have that part of the toe removed. Now, conversely, you don't want them to be too short because it's also part of their grasping mechanism for holding on to the perch, right? They stand right. all the time. Birds don't lay down. If your bird lays down, that's an emergency. Please call your veterinarian. They stand when they're sleeping. They stand when they're eating and they stand during the day. So to have their feet taken care of, just like your dog, is extremely important. They can get dry. They can get cracked. They can get painful and they can get osteoarthritis. So uh, same thing with our reptile friends. I don't see a lot of reptiles, but you want to keep their toenails short, not short, but, but the appropriate length. Yeah. Uh, I think it's appropriate because yeah, yeah. they're there yeah. for a reason, but if yes. they get too long, they can become ingrown, it's cause grasping. other problems. Yeah. 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 yeah, Grasping. And our, our cats as well, you know, cat toenails do need to be trimmed. You don't always, you don't always see your cat's toenails because they're, they're retracted. Um, but when they come, you know, when you, when you pull, when you feel the press on that little toe and get the toenail to come out, you can actually see the length of those toenails. And what happens is cat people don't check their to cat's toenails. Those toenails will grow and curve around and then start growing into the paw pad, particularly po cats that are polydactyl. Uh, and that's extremely painful and, and oftentimes leads to an infection. So it's really important to check your cat's toenails too. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of growing into the paw pad, that's what I call an ingrown nail. And, and, you know, dogs that can happen to them as well, especially if they're not up and around a whole lot, but especially that dew claw that, that we've mentioned right. so many times, you know, it's often neglected. It's certainly not weight bearing on a regular basis, if ever. And so it never gets filed down as the others <laughs> might on pavement with walking. So you pay attention because that's the one will, that will particularly wrap right around in a circle and grow up into that, their flesh. And yeah, again, talk about uncomfortable. That's, that's just that's, horrible. And, just and Megan did mention when we asked her, you know, what percentage of dogs nails are too long? And she said, all of them. <laughs> so her experience as a groomer, I mean, it just goes to show. And I actually got some great pictures of well-trimmed nails with some of my clients. And we'll put those on the social great. so people can see what that looks like. Yeah, let's post those. Yeah. And as we're, as we're wrapping up, let me ask you this. Are there any specific exercises or activities that you like that can help strengthen mm. our dog's feet and paw muscles? Well... I think it's it's harder to strengthen the muscles on the top side. Um, that would require lifting. So I guess, you know, maybe some stair climbing, going uphill, things like that. Easier to strengthen the flexors and support the arch, if you will. Um, and that would be through like digging, uh, holding toys or treats and, and having to to grasp. Um, but, you know, dogs grasp when they're holding on to things. I also think that, you know, like for our elders or 
you know, maybe dogs that are just coming off a fairly acute injury, um, simply walking on various surfaces. So we alluded to that before, like, you know, walking on grass and in sand and so forth is going to encourage articulation of, of the bones and gripping and use of those, those muscles. So proprioceptive a, opportunities, really proprioceptive yeah. Oh, yeah. Know, feedback. Yeah. yeah. It can be a, as simple, as simple as that. Along with that, Kathy, if their foot is particularly stiff, you know this, you know they have arthritis, um, they've lost the, the fat in their pads, as we mentioned before, that is another reason, not particularly strengthening, but more as a protective thing to walk on softer surfaces. So grass, dirt trails, those sorts of things, maybe things that are predictable, but, you know, not pavement because that's so hard. So the general rule of thumb is, you know, a happy medium, the, the Goldilocks uh, syndrome, where you're trying to find those things that are just right. If your dog's pads are dry, you want to add a little moisture, but not too much moisture. If your dog's pads are too moist and getting yeast, you may need to dry them out more. If your dog's pads are, or feet are stiff, you want to walk them on squishy surfaces, softer surfaces for shock absorption. If their feet are really pancakey and flat and, and move too much and don't support them well, you want to work on some strengthening to give them some structure in, in that foot. So I hope that makes sense. It is complicated. And I think that's why we love feet so much because there's so much to talk about. <laughs> we could have gone on for another hour mm. <laughs> about feet, but I hope that the whole point of the show was to really highlight the importance of your dog's foot and the importance of the care of your dog's foot. And I think that sometimes when you're thinking about your dog's care, you may not think about their feet. You might think about their ears and their teeth and whatever's going on internally. I hope it came across how important your dog's feet are to their overall health, wellness, and mobility. And check out our YouTube channel, Petability Podcast. We got a lot of great video tutorials and shows on there. We have that demo where we show you how to do the palpation and the toe stretching. So check that out as well. And you can always um, message us privately on Instagram and Facebook, right? That's right. If you need to, need to find us. There we are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Happy New Year. You too. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed our show. Follow us on social media at Petability Podcast. And please check out our affiliates and sponsors. Simply go to the show notes for information and links. Thank you and tune in next time.